This video is to explain the ratios that we went through in the week eight lecture and tutorial. Uh, both of you requested um, further information and help about how to calculate the ratios. Therefore, I've taken the tutorial questions from exercise 18-6 that you were given um, in last week's class to complete. Uh, so we will go through these ratios now, um, the ratios being the current ratio, the asset test ratio, the inventory turnover, the days in the inventory, the day sales and receivables, and the gross profit percentage. So these are the six key ratios that you'll be learning throughout the topic or throughout the subject. So I will explain to you how each of these ratios are calculated. You will then have this recording to be able to go through at your own pace and to re We'll go over this video as many times as you need in order to understand it in preparation uh, for your studies and for the final exam in the week 13. We will also go through these ratios in more detail in the beginning of week nine and conclude these with looking how they can connect all with the other ratios. So the first one we're gonna look at is the current ratio. Now, in order for the current ratio uh, to be calculated, we look at the formulas here with the answers provided. So in this case, the current ratio for part A is we take the total current assets of $172,000 and we divide that by the total current liabilities of $133,000. So this ratio is looking at how many times does the current assets go over the current liabilities or covers the current liabilities. What we're looking for here is the more times that the current assets can cover the current liabilities, the better. So the higher, the better. So in this case, the current ratio is 1.29. So that means the current assets cover the current liabilities by 1.29 times. Now, a ratio that you would be more comfortable with is 1.5 or above. So the higher, the better, as we say, because the more assets that you have, uh, to cover your more li the more liabilities, the better, okay? The alternative to the current ratio is the quick ratio, which measures the same uh, calculation. However, it only looks at the asset items that can be easily converted to cash immediately. And that is if you need to immediately pay your liabilities, what assets have you got available? Okay, so that's generally your cash, it's gonna be one, um, that you can easily convert to. So you're always your quick ratio will be lower than your current ratio. Okay, so we now look at the asset test ratio, which is part B. And this is what I mean in regards to the quick ratio, the alternative. So again, we look at our current liabilities, we divide by current liabilities of $133,000. And instead of this time totaling our current assets of $172,000, $172,000, we take the assets that can quickly be converted to immediately to cash so that we can pay our liabilities immediately. So in this case, it's $15,000 for cash, $11,000 for the short-term investments, and $54,000 represents the net receivables. So they are assets that we can quickly take and convert to cash, divided by our current liabilities. The reason why inventory and prepaid expenses are not considered in this asset test ratio of the quick ratio is because inventory may not be easily converted to cash because you actually need to sell the inventory before it can be converted. And that's only dictated by the supply and the demand um, from our customers. And prepaid expenses, as we know, are expenses paid in advance. We can't convert that into cash unless those services are provided by our service provider and ultimately we would get our money back. However, it is not easily converted to cash, hence we look at that. So the asset test ratio or the quick ratio is always gonna be less than the current ratio. The third um, ratio that we will be looking at, the third key ratio, is your inventory turnover. So again, how quickly do we turn over our, uh, turn over our inventory? The quicker, the better in terms of being able to convert this ratio into to, in regards to being able to convert our, um, um, our turnover. So in this case, we take the cost of sales at 
$315,000. And then we divide that by our average um, turnover or average, average stock on hand, inventory on hand. So that is our $77,000 plus our $69,000. So the current year, adding the closing um, inventory from the previous year and divide by two, the average of the two figures. So 77,000 plus 69,000 divided by two. So we take the $315,000 and divide it by this average. And in this particular example, we get 4.32 times. So what we're looking for here is the higher the inventory turnover, the better. So how many times do we turn our inventory over for the year? Okay. The quicker we turn our inventory over, as I said, the better. Because the longer we have our inventory um, in, in stock or on hand, the higher our storage costs are, the more of our assets are um, tied up in working capital, um, and the bigger the uh, bigger the threat that our stock will either be damaged, go out of stock, uh, go out of style, or be obsolete. So it's really, really important that the more we're turning over, the less those costs and risks are. So in this case, 4.32 times throughout the year, the inventory was completely turned over. Uh, the connection uh, to that. Um, to the inventory turnover is the days in inventory for the current year. So that is D, days in inventory. Again, the higher our, um, or the higher more times that our inventory is turned over, the lower the amount of days in inventory. So again, the amount of days in inventory represents the time that the inventory has arrived to the point that it is sold. Now, high inventory days, when you look at it, will actually constitute the higher the amount of days in inventory, the more again that our inventory is in working capital. And when you look at the amount of days in working capital, that can be added up from the time that we order the inventory, the time that it arrives, the time we then sell it and then get paid. So again, we want to try and have this inventory on hand for as little as possible. So the higher the inventory turnover, the lower the days in inventory. The lower the inventory turnover, the higher the days in inventory. So we want to try and make sure we're turning our inventory a lot and our days in inventory as low. So in order to um, understand the amount of days we have in inventory, we take the total amount of days in the year, which is 365 days, and we divide it by inventory turnover of 4.32 times. Of course, the amount of times during the year the inventory turnover, and that's how we get our 84 days. The next ratio that we're going to be looking at is the amount of days sales and receivables, another calculation in regards to our working capital. Okay, so again, what we're going to try to achieve here is the lowest amount of days of sales and receivables. The lower the amount of days and receivables, the better our collection policies are. The higher our days and days sales and receivables, the worse our, um, our collection policies are. And it's also a good benchmark to understand, um, in, in, in effect, uh, how, how well our collection days are compared to our policy days. So again, the, the, net, the higher the amount of days of your um, collection policy, the higher your day sales receivable. But again, some um, organisations or businesses might have 30 days. So some have 14. So providing that our days of sales and receivables um, are closer to our policy, yeah, that's the main thing we're looking at here. So first of all, in order to work out our day sales and receivable, we need to work out our one day sales. So in order to get that, we take our total net credit sales, not our total sales. So the amount of sales that were actually sold on credit on accounts receivable, or well in this case, it's 462,000 um, sales for the, for, the, for the year in terms of on credit and we divide that by 365 days. So that gets us $1,265.75. So that is the amount of credit sales in one particular day. And then that becomes our denominator. However, what we divide that by is we take our accounts receivable, the current year, net receivables or trade debtors or accounts receivable of the current year, we add that to our um, uh, accounts receivable, trade net as net receivables closed at the previous year, and we divide it by two to get our average net receivables or our average trade debtors or our average accounts receivable. 
that we take our account, average accounts receivable on, on our balance sheet, divided by any the average day sale, one day sale on the credit, and in this case, we get 50 days. Okay, so there's two parts again. So recapping, we take our total credit sales for the year, divided by the amount of days in the year, to get on average each day how much we sold on credit. Then what we do is we get our average net receivables or average accounts receivables or trade debtors for the year on average on hand, divided by our one day sale average to get the amount of days. So again, what we're looking for here is making sure that our amount of days that our sales are in, you know, waiting to be collected is as close to, as possible or lower than our collection policy. Now finally, the gross profit percentage that we're looking at. So again, these are the gross profit is your sales, less your direct costs, less your materials, uh, your cost to deliver the stock. Okay, so again, the amount of gross profit determines the amount of net profit we're gonna have in the end. And we need to make sure that we've got enough gross profit to at least cover our overheads, if not more. So the higher our gross profit percentage, the better. So in this case, gross profit, we work out by taking the amount of sales, $162,000 a year, divided by our cost of sales, our direct cost, $315,000, and we looked at uh, gross sales and direct costs in accounting one, and we divide that again by the net, uh, divided by the sales, which gives us our gross percentage of 31.8%. So what we're looking for is how much is our gross profit compared to our overall sales? Obviously, the higher the better. So, like I said, when we did benchmarking in our in our um, class last week, we we're looking at the various benchmarks. So we're comparing that percentage to what others are doing in the industry. It's very very difficult to compare gross profit percentages compared to um, other businesses in general, because some businesses might come from industries uh, which have low volume, high profit margin in terms of their very unique products. Um, example, selling prestige cars. You don't know, generally sell a lot of prestige cars, but you sell them at a markup. So they rely on a high gross profit percentage uh, compared to a business that's in the tire industry, selling a lot of tires with a low gross profit margin, but high volume. So they rely on the volume, um, attracting uh, people on price. So again, you can't compare um, bench percentages of benchmarkings compared to business in general the more your competitors and businesses in the industry. So what we've gone through um, in this video is the um, six common ratios, current ratio, asset test or, test or quick ratio, inventory turnover, days in inventory, day sales and receivables, and the gross profit percentage. Okay, so in, um, in, in conclusion with this video, these are the most commonly used ratios that we'll be learning throughout the uh, subject and for the exam. We will go through this again at the beginning of next week's class um, and or beginning of the week nine class and see if you need any further help in tying these ratios with the remaining ratios that uh, you need to be able to do. If you have any questions um, in relation uh, to what I've shared today, you can email me um, and we can go through those in more detail.